Amen. Please have a seat. Tonight we are, today, we are focusing on the Sermon of the Mount. And as we focused on the Sermon on the Mount over the last few weeks, we've talked about this idea that when we apply the words of Jesus to our lives, He changes us. He turns our life upside down. He will literally change the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we love other people. And I don't know about you, but I know that there's enough left of me, of my old life, of who I once was, that needs the words of Jesus applied to my life constantly. I want to have my life completely turned upside down. I want to follow Jesus wholeheartedly and fully devoted. Tonight as we look, or today as we look at Jesus' words found in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, I hope as a result we will all pray differently when we leave. Have you thought much about what your prayer life looks like? For many of us, it's a few uh, rushed words. Maybe we're rushing out the door or maybe we're uh, driving to work and we'll mumble off a few thoughts. I haven't spoken to God yet today, so I want to squeeze in some prayer time. What does your prayer life look like? Would you like to spend more time with God? Would you like to spend more time in prayer with God? Last week, Pastor Chad challenged us to uh, pick up the brochure that was at the back of the, the, the Welcome Center, the Connection Center, pick it up and apply that to our lives, spending a focused time in prayer with God. What does your prayer life look like? I grew up Catholic. Anybody else grow up Catholic here? Okay, so you're going to get more of a chuckle out of this than anybody else. You'll probably laugh a little bit harder and other people will say, oh, that's, I don't want to be offensive. I was an altar boy. Any other altar boys? That, okay, thank you, sir, for your honesty. He felt obligated to raise his hand, though. That's a Catholic guilt. I went to Catholic school until fifth grade. I learned the rosary. I prayed it at least once a week. Now, if you don't know what the rosary is, the rosary is about uh, 50 Hail Marys all round up. And it has uh, endings and beginnings of our fathers and glory bees. And you kneel down. And I would remember praying with my mom scripted prayers the same words over and over and over again. For instance, the words of the Hail Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Yeah, see, there's a fellow Catholics right there. I learned the glory be. Uh, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the... It is now and ever... World without end, amen. Everything was word for word what somebody else would say. We had prayers to saints for everything. I remember in third grade learning a scripted prayer to St. Anthony, the patron saint of lost things. And St. Anthony, if you lost something, whether it was a comb or a car or a friend, you would go to St. Anthony in your prayer closet and say, Good St. Anthony, come around. Something's lost and can't be found. <laughs> Scripted prayers. So the question is this. Does Jesus want us to pray to dead people? No. Does God want us to pray to dead people? No, and does God want us also to just pray scripted prayers? There are many churches today that take a look at the Lord's Prayer. That's the prayer that we're going to look at tonight. They take a look at the Lord's Prayer and they might open up with, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we hear coaches say that at the beginning of football games, maybe huddled around. But is that what God wants of us? Day in and day out, the disciples have witnessed Jesus praying to God. Day in and day out as the, as the disciples walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus and spent time with Jesus and observed him doing miracles, they observed a warm, powerful, hot connection that Jesus had with his heavenly father. Prayer wasn't for Jesus something that was scripted, something that was said by route, something that was said over and over again. Prayer was pouring his heart out to God in prayer. Psalm 62, 8 says, Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. 
pour out your heart to him, God is a refuge for us. Understand that prayer is not scripted words. They're not words that mean nothing. In fact, prayer is God's people pouring our hearts out to him. Now, granted, we certainly may not have time all the time, every day, to sit and pour our heart out to God. Sometimes our prayers are a little more shallow than they are deep. But sometimes we need those deep, meaningful, life-changing moments of prayer where we're encountering God at a deeper, deeper level so that our lives continue to be changed so that we continue to grow. See, as followers of Jesus, we're not called to remain the same. Everything about our walk with God must increase. Everything about living in holiness must get better. We shouldn't be content with being scum-sucking pig sinners, right? We should be pressing into God saying, God, I know who you've designed me to be, or I know who I am, and I need you to keep changing me and helping me to grow. So the disciples had observed Jesus pouring his heart out to God, and they finally come to him one day and said in Luke chapter 11, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pour your heart out to God like, uh, like we see you do often. Jesus would get up in the morning. He would go out into the wilderness and pray. But there were times when the disciples were also around him. How do we know that? Because they went to him and said, hey, teach us to pray like you do. They understood that prayer is best caught than taught. Have you ever been around somebody that just seemed to have a great prayer life? And you know, I'm following the sermon where Chad made fun of long-winded preachers and long-winded prayers last week, right? So uh, Pastor Chad talked about the uh, public prayers and how they were so long that he timed it. And the pastor actually prayed for 14 minutes, right, Chad? 17 minutes. <sighs> yeah. So tonight, uh, I am going to, what you see here tonight or today, I am going to model my personal quiet time so that perhaps you can take something from it when you leave this place. It makes me a little nervous, to be quite honest. I, I don't know what God wants to show me. I don't know what God wants to convict me of. I don't know how God wants to change my heart. Nothing is scripted from the moment I sit down in this chair to spend time with the Lord. Because I want it to be real, I want it to be genuine, and I want it to be transferable. I want it to be something that you can go home and duplicate. So before we go there, I want us to look at what Jesus taught about prayer in Matthew chapter 6. It's found on page 964. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now there are many other prayers in the New Testament, but this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. But it wasn't to be repeated vain repetitiously. That's what Jesus was rebuking in the Pharisees. That's what Jesus was rebuking in the, the Sadducees and the religious leaders. They didn't mean anything that they said, and they just had these scripted words that they prayed over and over again. Babbling is oftentimes what it's called. The point of the Lord's Prayer is to model how we ought to pray. We ought to pray like this. We ought to pray similar to this, but not word for word. Why? Because God wants relationship. He doesn't want religion. He wants relationship. He wants to connect with you. He wants you to pour your heart out to him, and he wants to speak to you and encourage you from his word. Now let's look at verse 10. We have to start off with our prayer time with the right attitude. Jesus' attitude, the attitude that he taught his disciples to have is, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. See, often we go to God as though God is this genie and we're about to rub the lamp with prayer. We're going to go to God and we want God to do our will as opposed to his will being done in our lives. 
And so first and foremost, when we encounter God and when we go to God in prayer, it's not bringing this bucket list of requests. He wants to hear from us and he wants to hear our needs, but it's not to change his will. It's having the humility to say, God, your will be done first and foremost in my life, just as it is in heaven. Are you willing and do you trust God enough to do that? Do you trust God enough to let his will be done in your life? Because even if you don't like it, he's going to carry you through it. He's going to walk with you through whatever those, those decisions are. So I want to ask you a question. Have you ever tried to bend God's desire to your own? Raise your hand if you've ever prayed for the winning lottery ticket. Uh, raise your hand if when you were in college, you asked God to help you pass the test that you did not study for. Right. <laughs> raise your hand if you were ever pulled over by a police officer. And as he's on his way to give you a ticket, you're praying that you will get out of that ticket. Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. What does God want for you? Well, he wants you to stop speeding. He wants you to go slower. So what might God have to do? Give you a big $350 ticket to get out of that. We've often viewed God as a genie as opposed to our heavenly father. Today, as we zero in and focus on the Lord's prayer for a minute and then jump into this quiet time, I want to encourage you to extract what you can from this time. It's all about his will being done in our lives. See, prayer ought to bend my desires to God's will. As I pray, as you'll see in just a minute, God ought to be changing me. God ought to be bending my desires to his will. That's what my life ought to look like in these next few moments. That Because his will is perfect, his, uh, our will is imperfect, his desires are uh, greatest, our desires are often sinful and selfish. Going to God on a regular basis and asking him to work his will out in our lives does create a humble spirit. When life throws difficult challenges at you, you're able to go to God with a greater humble attitude if you're constantly with the mindset of, God, your will be done. Change my selfish desire to yours. But it's not only about asking God for things, as we mentioned, it is a conversation. My Catholic church, my Catholic school, my Catholic mom, my Catholic nuns, my Catholic priests, the nuns, they never taught me that prayer was a conversation with God. They never taught me that prayer was my opportunity to talk to him and I got to hear back from him. Everything was scripted, everything was memorized, but they never taught me how to converse with him. Conversation with God can make us uncomfortable and the reason why is because he already knows us. He knows if we're trying to hide something from him. He, he knows if we're not confessing something to him. He knows if we're being stubborn about we know he wants something for our lives, but we don't want to do it. God knows our thoughts before we even think of them. And so when we enter that conversation with God, knowing it is going to make us uncomfortable. In fact, scripted prayers are much more comfortable than an unscripted prayer. Yeah, a scripted prayer, you can stick with, say it, I said my penance, get up and go. But that's not what God wants. God wants his word to dig through our hearts and our lives. He wants to encourage us with his word. He wants to challenge us with his word. He wants to speak to us just as our hearts and our spirit longs to speak with him. And he wants to have a daily conversation about our whole life. Look at verse 11, 12, and 13. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we converse with God, look what we can bring up. We can bring up the needs of the present. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. What is that? That's the needs of the present. Give us this day our daily bread. Bring up to God as you talk with him your needs of the present. And also take a look at verse 12. We can talk about needs in the past. What are those? 
Oftentimes they're through broken relationships. There's sin that we, uh, there's forgiveness that we need to give to other people. There's a, there's a right relationship. There's a relationship that, that was broken and needs to be restored. That's needs of the past. See, I don't, I don't have any physical needs for something that happened yesterday, but I have spiritual needs about something that happened yesterday. Maybe a relationship with my wife uh, got hurt, or maybe a relationship with my children got hurt, or maybe a relationship with a coworker got hurt. Therefore, I've got to go to God about the needs that I have in the past past because those can weigh me down as well. And then there's help in the future promised in Matthew chapter 6 verse 13. Deliver us from evil. That's in the future. If I'm spending time with Lord, I'm not being attacked by the evil one. I'm, I'm in his presence. I'm talking with him. But there's going to be trouble down the road. You will face temptation. It might be the temptation to live a lukewarm uh, following Jesus' life. Uh, it may be a temptation to respond in disobedience to something that you know God wants for you. It may be a temptation when it comes to the internet or television or, or, or pornography or, or another relationship. God, help me now, strengthen me now so that I can stand in the future, help in the future. So now I want to uh, do the part that's going to make me very uncomfortable. Um, I have a few tools that I use for my quiet time. Uh, this is my, uh, this would be my a prayer journal. Um, started journaling years and years ago, uh, I think about 1990, uh, 92, 93. Started writing down my uh, words, writing down my thoughts, writing down my prayers uh, as I would talk to God. And uh, so I stopped using this last summer and I went to a digital tablet uh, where I'm writing it now and everything is cool and it's all there and I get to write the words and it stays there as long as something corrupt doesn't happen to the hard drive. So, but for the, the sake of tonight, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the tablet aside and I'm going to go back to my old journal. I also have a pen that I use. Why? Because the palest ink is better than the sharpest memory. It's an old Chinese proverb. When God is speaking to you, don't you think you ought to write it down? You know, if God is working in your heart, don't you think you ought to write it down? If you're asking questions about God's word, you ought to write it down. And so uh, I have my pen as well, and I have my trusty Bible. Uh, I have a Bible that I can read and I can understand the translation. It, I, I get it. I understand it. And I want to talk to God uh, as I read scripture tonight. I don't always have a prayer time like what I'm going to have with you tonight. Sometimes I'm in New Testament, other times I'm in Old Testament places. What I love about the Psalms is the Psalms are prayers. You can't go wrong praying God's word back to him. And if you've ever hit a spiritual rut, if you've ever said, man, I, God, I don't, I don't understand. I don't, uh, I don't sense your presence in my life. I feel like I'm far from you going on those feelings. I feel dry. I feel empty. I feel barren. I feel lonely. I want to encourage you to do what I'm about to demonstrate on your own. So now let me explain what I'm going to do. I will be reading Psalm 40. I'll read a couple verses at a time. Let's see, that's on page 553 if you want to follow along. It is a different translation, but it's on page 553. And I'll read uh, one or two verses, and then I'm going to take those verses and I'm going to turn them back to a prayer to God. Uh, I've not pre-read Psalm 40. I've read Psalm 40 before, but I've not pre-read it. As I was talking to the Lord this morning, uh, he assured me that number 40 is where he wanted me to be. I have been praying all week long, Lord, uh, if there's any unconfessed sin in my life, please reveal it now as opposed to Saturday when I am preaching or Sunday when I am preaching. So I feel pretty clean, but maybe not fully. So as I read these words, I'm going to turn them back into a prayer and have a conversation with God. I'm modeling it not to be religious, but to help you in your relationship with God. Uh, so nothing is planned. Uh, again, nothing is scripted. Nothing is written out. It says Psalm 40 in my tablet. And I am terrified. Uh, I'm terrified because I'm not a perfect man. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to me. Uh, one of the prayers that I always pray at the beginning is found in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, where the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Uh, test me and know my anxious thoughts. 
point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So as I go into this time of prayer, those will be the first words that I say to God. God, point out anything in me that offends you. And that can be very frightening for anybody. Um, but uh, this, is, this is my time with the Lord. And I hope and pray that, that it will be a benefit to you as well. Instead of journaling, you're not just going to be sitting here watching me write. Instead of journaling, what I'm going to do is I might, I might put something down for me. Um, but instead of journaling, I'm going to say my words out loud. Instead of journaling, I'm going to speak them out loud. Let, let you hear me wrestle with the thoughts that uh, I'm thinking in regard to these uh, scripture passages, this scripture passage. So I've asked the guys to turn down the house lights uh, because I, I will get even more nervous because it's an audience of one and I have an audience of 400 tonight. Um, but I love God. I love the, the work that Jesus has done in my life. And I hope that you'll be able to take something and apply it to your prayer life tonight and let your life become just more dynamic, uh, more focused on God and help you to listen to him even better. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for allowing me to come to you, to talk to you. I want to ask God that your spirit would search me, know my anxious thoughts, reveal those. Lord, reveal any unconfessed sin in my life, areas of selfishness, areas of stubbornness. Lord, I, I want to be more like Jesus in my life. And so God, I pray that you would point out anything that I'm doing in my life that is offensive to you, that's not been confessed, that's not been repented of. And Father, help me to follow you more clearly and more closely. I ask tonight that people would hear and see this modeled and that you would change their lives tomorrow morning in their prayer time. Lord, speak to me now and change me. Transform me into the man of God you've called me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. Oh, Lord, my God, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. You take no delight in sacrifices or offerings. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I've come. As is written about me in the scriptures, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out as you, O Lord, well know. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have talked about your faithfulness and saving power. Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. Let your unfailing love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles surround me, too many to count. My sins pile up so high I can't see my way out. They outnumber the hairs on my head. I have lost all courage. Please, Lord, rescue me. Come quickly, Lord, and help me. May those who try to destroy me be humiliated and put to shame. 
May those who take delight in my trouble be turned back in disgrace. Let them be horrified by their shame, for they said, Aha, we've got him now. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, The Lord is great. As for me, since I am poor and needy, let the Lord keep me in his thoughts. You are my helper and my savior, O oh my God. Do not delay. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me and he turned to me and heard my cry. God, I, I can honestly tell you I struggle with knowing whether or not I wait patiently on you or whether I jump ahead of you. I don't know, God, that I'm as patient as you want me to be. I think about my calling here to Calvary. I think about the transition from Arkansas to here. And I'm constantly concerned of whether or not It was me, my desire, was I being impatient? So Lord, I continue to live with that question, but I see your grace being revealed all around me. I, I see how people have become followers of Christ. I hear weekly how people are encouraged and you're reminding me that this was your path for me. And God, so often though, I run ahead. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. Lord, I thank you for rescuing me from the mud, from the pit of despair that I was in before I gave my life to Jesus. You rescued me from years of abuse. You rescued me from those names that my dad said to me, and called me. You rescued me from the person I was becoming, shaped by my dad, that I was pathetic. I was a loser. I was stupid. I was an idiot. I couldn't do anything right. You rescued me from that mud and that mire. You rescued me from a sense of hopelessness that had overgrown my heart. You rescued me from the darkness of sin. You rescued me from a, a future that was certainly destined to be lived in utter disgrace. And you set my feet on the rock. You gave me a firm place to stand, Lord. I, week in and week out, I get to talk about the good things that Jesus has done. Week in and week out, Father, I get to talk about the goodness of God being revealed in my life. While I grew up, I wondered where you were. And now, God, I just ask where you're not. It doesn't matter where I go. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. You are constantly my best friend. You're constantly here with me. You gave me a firm place to stand. I'm not ashamed of who I was becoming. He has given me a new song to sing. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. You changed my song. You gave me hope when I had none. You showed me what joy was. You showed me what life is. You gave me the most incredible woman to walk with me in this life. You gave me a woman that loves Jesus and she loves me fiercely and she loves our children fiercely. And every day I get to see life while not perfect, but 
so far removed from my childhood. Such a contrast. You put a song of praise in my mouth. And many have seen it, God. Many, many have seen it. Many have related to it. And you've led many people to Jesus as a result of my story. Thank you. So God, then let me keep telling my story. Let me keep worshiping you with this new song that you've placed in my heart. Oh, the joys of those who trust the Lord, who have no confidence in the proud or in those who worship idols. God, help me to trust you more. I know that there is great joy waiting. God, so often I want to run ahead. I want to run ahead in this house that we're looking at. God, I don't know that you want us to be patient. I don't know that you want us to move ahead. I don't know what you want for us right now. But I know my hope is in you and my trust is in you. And I can wait as long as I need to wait. If this house is where you want us to go, then God, you'll put us there. Lord, you have performed many wonders for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. You have no equal. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. God, what you have done in my family's life has been absolutely amazing, Father. I praise you for it. I praise you, God, for the way that you've been changing us. I praise you, God, for the numerous things that you have done. You've given us four amazing children thank you for the blessing that we have in sophie with her type 1 diabetes thank you god while we pray that you would take that disease from her we've seen it as a blessing that has sharpened her this is changing her it's causing her to become more compassionate more caring, more courageous. We thank you for the way that you've blessed us here at Calvary with so many people that have reached out to us and so many people that have loved us and so many people that have encouraged us. Thank you that we have a great staff to work with. Thank you that we have a great church family. Your work in our lives is too numerous to count. I'm just so glad, God, that I'm being used by you in a place where I can have impact and also, Father, in a place where there is great joy and great grace. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. Lord, let me confess right there, I don't often, as often as I should, take joy in doing your will. Sometimes, God, your will is hard. Sometimes it's overwhelming to do what we may not want to do. It rubs me hard sometimes. But Lord, you show me in the long run the joy that is for those that follow you. And you show me that while you call us to walk through hard situations in life, that there is joy on the other side of those. That there's an incredible peace that surpasses all understanding on the other side of the hard. So God, help me to walk with obedience. Help me to speak with obedience. Help me to love with obedience. Knowing, God, that that is your will for my life. I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out as you, Lord, know a well. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have talked about your faithfulness and saving power. God, I am not even going to focus on those words right now. Thank you. It's your story that you're writing in my life. 
It's your story that you're writing in my children's lives, in my wife's life. God, you get credit, you get glory, draw people to you. But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness in you. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. God, first, I want to be a searcher of you. I, I want to keep searching for you. I want to search for you in a sermon. I want to search for you in worship. I want to search for you as I'm driving my car. I want to search for you as I'm dating my wife. I want to search for you as I talk to my children. God, I want... I want, to, I want to search for you and I want to find you. I want to find those places where you're at work in our neighbor's life. I want to find those places that where you're at work in my kid's life, my family life. God, I want to find those places where you're at work. And Lord, I want you to use me to advance your kingdom in those areas. Let me be a grace shower. Let me be kind. Let me be loving. Let me be caring even about random people who show up on our doorstep and knock on our door. Help me to love them as I ought to. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, the Lord is great. Well, God, you're great. Lord, you are great. I love your salvation. I love the way you've changed me. I love the way you've given me hope. I love the way you've forgiven me of my sins. The Lord is great. Thank you, God, for loving me. Lord, help me to keep coming to the end of myself on a daily basis. Help me to continue to pour my heart out to you. Help me to walk in obedience. Help me to listen to you. Turn me into the man of God that you desire me to be. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Now, I'm not saying that every time that you sit down with the Lord, it ought to look like that. But I do want to encourage you to pour your heart out to him, whatever that looks like. If you're going through a rocky season in your marriage, have you poured your heart out to God using Scripture? You might pour your heart out to a friend or to a family member or even to someone else, to your pastor. But are you pouring your heart out to God? He loves you. He wants that relationship with you. He wants to talk with you and to guide you through it. He wants to lift you up out of that pit of despair and set your feet on a rock and give you a firm place to stand. But you got to pour your heart out to him. When was the last time that you sat in God's presence and talked with him? You just spent time reading the word, talking to him as you would talk to a friend, talking to him as though he's right across the table, listening to you, with his hand on your shoulder, allowing you to sob or allowing you to laugh or allowing you to experience great grace and great joy. For many of us, it has been too long since we sat at the table with God. For many of us, it has been too long since we poured out our heart to him. You don't have to let another 24 hours go by before you grab your Bible and you grab your pen and you open up to a psalm and you begin reading a few words and making them your own and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your heart, to dig junk up, to dig relationship stuff up, to dig future stuff up and just allowing Him to love on you through that difficult or joyful season. In just a second, Jesse's going to come back up and lead us. The band's going to come back up and lead us in a time of worship. 
The first song is going to be a little bit slower. It's a good time to reflect and it's a good time to call out to God and a good time to spend time with him because you can get alone with God right here, right now in this place. You don't have to walk someplace else. You just got to drop the hand of the person you're holding and, and focus. Pour your heart out to God. And then the final song he's going to do is a little peppy and it's a little joyful. That's the way we ought to be because God doesn't want us to roll around in our sin. He doesn't want us to roll around in our shame. He wants us to remember that he is grace and that we have joy and forgiveness as we walk through the hardness of life. So you celebrate, you worship, you call out to God as you ought to and as you need to. Let's talk to God now as I close in prayer. Lord, we love you. God, thank you just for allowing me to spend a little, a little time with you in front of my friends. Lord, I pray that you would use tonight's example, not in a way that puffs up, but in a way that changes lives. It changes relationships. Maybe it changes relationships within their families, relationship with you. But God, let this example be transforming for them. God, we pray that as we worship you, you would be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.